Aloha, everyone joining. We're just going to wait about a minute to get started. Uh, thank you for joining. You are in the culture and academics, a match made in best practices session. We're going to wait about a minute and then we'll get we'll get going. Hi, if you're just coming in, you're joining the culture and academics, a match made in best practices session. Uh, we're gonna get started. Oh, we're gonna get started right now. It's 8.15. Aloha and welcome again to the culture and academics, a match made in best practices. My name is Oleni Lilly, and I'm just so ecstatic to uh, introduce and share our panelists and all of their experiences and their knowledge. Was that not an amazing keynote session? I'm so excited because this session here uh, really speaks to sort of the strategies and the heart and the work that these people, the panelists will be sharing are really some of the how to's about what our keynote speaker was sharing as it relates to culture, the environment, academics, and also healing and connection. So let's go ahead and get this clean. This presentation is produced under U.S. Department of Education contract number GS00F115CA with Synergy Enterprises, Inc. The views expressed herein do not necessarily represent the positions or policies of the U.S. Department of Education. No official endorsement by the U.S. Department of Education of any product, commodity, service, or enterprise mentioned herein is intended or should be inferred. Great, so now that we're disclaimed, I'm Olani Lilly, aloha. Um, I'm with the OIE Technical Assistance Team. I am currently Zooming in from Hilo, Hawaii. And I just have such an honor and I'm so proud to introduce this, the panelists. We've been working hard um, through the months to put together a really exciting uh, session for you. The first person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Henry Fowler. Uh, he is from Tonalea, Arizona. He's a member of the Navajo tribe and is an associate math professor of the Navajo at Navajo Technical University in Crown Point, New Mexico. Uh, he was born in Bitterwater and born to a Zuni Edgewater. His maternal grandparents are many goats and his paternal grandparents are red running into the water. Dr. Fowler is the co-founder of the Navajo Math Circles. The Navajo Math Circles provide teacher workshops for grades K through 12 and work with over 40 mathematicians to promote math education for students from the Navajo Nation. We also have joining us from Fort Peck um, Community College, Roxanne Smith. Uh, she was raised by her paternal grandparents, her grandmother Frida, a boarding school survivor, her grandfather Neville, a farmer and rancher. She is married to Robert and has three sons, Sean, Bighorn, Ray, and Jordan Smith, and treasures her time with her grandsons, Darren and Hayden Bighorn. Roxanne is an alumni of Fort Pitt College, Rocky Mountain College, and Leslie University, where she earned her BS Economics and Business and MED degree in Curriculum Instruction. Currently, is a school engagement coordinator um, for the Shanti Project at North Penn Community College. Also, I'd like to introduce Martel. Um, he is, uh, I'm sorry, Martel, I don't know how to pronounce it. Ashini Boni name is Shataga. Is that correct? Shataga. Hello, my sorry. Um, born in Idaho, but raised his entire life at Wolf Point, Montana. He served 12 years in the US Army and after leaving the Army moved home um, with a lot of trauma and no tools to appropriately deal with it. He struggled with addiction for five years and really didn't find his path until he found his cultural ways. He's been sober for seven years now and has been such a breath of fresh air to, to live a good life. In 2014, he returned home and completed his bachelor's degree. Currently, he works in the Shantae Project, which allows him to work with reservation schools with the intent of raising graduation rates, improving math, 
and reading scores and building more family engagement. But really his heart is around connecting to the kids and providing them connections um, to their culture, their environment, and to each other and their community. We also have Ed Bauer joining us from Fort Peck Community College. Um, he is grew up on the Fort Peck uh, Indian Reservation and attended high school in Fraser, Montana. He also attended the University of Montana Missoula campus and is currently enrolled at Fort Peck um, Community College. He is also um, a uh, community coordinator within the Shante Project and is passionate about helping um, the vulnerable among us and uplifting his people of the Fort Peak um, Reservation. He survives to be a positive example and inspiration to young people everywhere. Those are our panelists. So let's get started. Our objectives today are really to understand the elements of a strong academic program that is culturally based to map, um, also to map um, first steps of our ongoing journey toward an integration of culture, native culture and your programs. There are different degrees of cultural integration. Some of you may be exploring how to integrate culture into your academics. Some of you may have begun to provide cultural activities. Uh, others are maybe providing cultural activities within the context of a native language instruction. And some base their entire academic curriculum and instruction on native knowledge and practices. Here are some of the core sort of basic aspects of a culture-based program. Definitely, um, again, the culture-based program usually integrates and highly depends on the environment as a learning uh, laboratory or as a learning place. Uh, not all learning happens within four walls. There are lots of opportunities that are taken based on the season and the climate to get students out and engaged in cultural practices that occurred within their environment. Also language and native language and arts is a key piece of a culture-based um, program. Whether it is full immersion or maybe the introduction of language um, through motion and activity and, and practices. Um, there are a wide range of ways that programs are implementing and bringing native language into culture-based education. There's also ancestral skill building, solver problem and developing solutions. These ancestral skill building uh, to skills can go anywhere from, like I said, solving problems, um, dealing with conflict, to actually developing keen observation skills, uh, understanding uh, the different activities and being able to read the environment and environmental literacy skills. Uh, additionally, there's an emphasis on familial practice. So getting to know the practices of family and community and whether it's uh, continuing to engage or to revitalize uh, that practice Many uh, culture-based programs have this as a key element. Also, there is action. If you look across all the culture-based um, activities at different levels, there is this uh, thread that runs through it around not just learning things, but then acting upon them and looking that, at that action as being a sense of responsibility and relationship building. Right now, we're gonna go ahead and go to um, our polls. We're gonna do a little poll. So if you can go to the left hand of your um, of this presentation site, click on polls, and you should see the first poll at the top. Also, this implementation matrix is also found in the files section or under the files tab of this presentation. What this um, implementation matrix is take those one, two, three, four, five basic areas and look at the different sort of levels that you could possibly be at. So why don't you take a fast scan at this matrix and maybe decide which area um, you are strong in. You can go ahead and vote um, in the first poll. So is your uh, organization more exploring versus emerging, or is it implementing and or sustaining? So go ahead and pick one of those that you feel overall your organization 
uh, aligns to. Awesome. So we looks like we got a lot of people um, uh, implementing right now. There's 45% are emerging. Oh, good. We're getting more that are sustaining. It looks like emerging is still sort of 50% over 33% implementing. Awesome. You can take a couple more uh, minutes and or a couple more seconds actually uh, to go ahead and put in your, um, what you think your overall organization is. And then we can take a look at the results. All right. Again, it's uh, at the closing, it looks like 47% of us are in emerging as it relates to culture-based education and programs. Let's move on. And so now um, Dr. Henry Fowler is going to walk us through Navajo culture and feud math lessons. Go ahead, take it away, Dr. Fowler. Yeah, yeah. It's a good afternoon or good morning, depending on your location across 50 states or all listeners that signed up today. Um, I'm from the Navajo Nation. We, we have our Navajo Nation in the three states comprised of New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. And this is about the size of um, West Virginia. If you start at the furthest end to the other end of the nations, it take about seven, six hour drive across. So it's very diversified. We're into different regions on the Navajo Nation. Um, I'm from the yellow region, that's the Tuba City the Western Agency. That's where I was raised. And now um, I live in the Chinle Agency, right in the middle of the Navajo Nation. So there's a, been a huge debate about using reservation or nation among my people. Since we are a sovereign nation, we have our own policies um, to govern ourselves. We are um, a Navajo nation. So next, in the reality of um, Navajo way of viewing their world, the first one is um, I'm a bitter water, that I am a bitter water connected to my mother side of the clan group. So it's a matrilineal society, Navajo. And it's the, on the woman's side that has the ability to um, bring the tradition, the culture, the lens to the next generation. So that's the responsibility. And my mother is a bitter water. So she brought the, the lens while I was growing up on the Navajo Nation in the Western Agency. And the three area that highlights the culture of Navajo way of life is eh, eh, is very important. And that's the first bullet is to establish relationship with everything that is around you, including the rivers, the mountains, and the earth, the universe, the cosmos, and the plant life, so you interact with that within your space, within you, in your environment. So we view the world as nature. The universe is our teacher who give us a sense of time and space who we are as Navajo people. So we refer that as from the more how we relate and how we interact with our space, our environment. That's how we build relationship is like a whole So we look at even as plant life, we look at rocks, 
we look at things that is around us as everything is alive. So we greet a tree, we talk to a tree, we talk to rivers as Navajo. That's how we build that relationship, that communication that builds our self-confidence, self-identity as who we are as Navajo people. But our life is all about hujo, the third bullet is about balance, it's about peace, it's about purpose, who we are as we call ourselves in the Navajo land, which is the ne. So that's our boundary. We have to have certain boundaries that we relate to, to our environment, who we are as the ne people. So hojong is harmony and peace and given us motivation, confidence, and innovation, and enlightenment and awakening in our space who we are as the ne. You look at the picture, that's a, a traditional Navajo home. It's, we call it a, a hogan. Next slide. And this is our holistic approach to Navajo way of life. On the upper right is Nsahakis. That is our philosophy is that we have to have a frame of thought, a frame of thinking. And that thinking brings a vision, a purpose, and also goals and objectives to accomplish who we are as people. And when I was growing up on on the Navajo Nation, we were, we, were, we were called up early to run towards East and look and have a vision while we run so that that vision that we instill in our mind and that brings a Navajo we call Paul so that we are able to understand who we are as Navajo people. So the thinking is the central element of who we are from the element. Um, the right corner is Nahatsa, is our planning. So planning help us build the frame who we are and our reference to what we want to do. And that makes our life who we are as the net people on the left corner is life is enough, is the career, the skills, and what we want to accomplish and how we want to create that living to be in harmony and using the three principle, building relationship and communication, and also drawing forth on the energy of the nature. And the last on the left upper corner is the Sihasan, is never forget your spirituality. You have a, a place when things are challenging, when things are tough, you root back yourself to your home, to your fire, who you are as a person, and use that strength to move forward. So all of this encompasses our emotion, psychological, spiritual, and physical being, who we are as Navajo people. So this provides the strength, who we are as the ne, the ne hini na, that is our life. Next slide. And the central core of our Navajo traditional way of life is called so sa means to grow, to mature, to develop. And when you develop your skills, when you develop your intellectual power, you're able to create a system. That system will be integrated as a holistic approach to improve lives of everything that you interact with. So we say that Navajo way of life is the four principles that I laid out that I mentioned, thinking, planning, enough, and 
spirituality, sihasin, it came from our, the power of our creator, the creator being the different stars that we chart, that we look at and that makes who we are as the people. So we use the star, the constellation, and that is our calendar that tells us when to plant, when to um, collect herbs and when to be in line and when the change in seasons gonna happen from different time of seasons. And it is our orientation of who we are as the net people. It provides that sense of space, that peace and that harmony. Next. So this is integrated. So the top heading is the word that I talked about uh, in Navajo font. It, um, it should be reading So the sa is again to develop, to mature and, and to awakening who you are as a person. And na the next piece is about um, processes, procedures, and these processes and procedures, they have an outcome. And at the end is to have your ethics of harmonious and balance in life, who you are as a person. So you may have also that you move off from the path of the corn pollen. So this is when it's important for you to realign yourself to the traditional teaching, the harmonious, the balanced way of life, who you are as a Diné person. So this covers all the aspect of the Sanahalebik Ahajan, the metaphysics and the ispinology, our thought, our knowledge, who we are as the net people, and that draws our sense of our thinking. It's the thought, the Navajo thought is very powerful in, Nav in Navajo way of life. Next. And the integration um, of culture, who we are as the Neh home is a sacred place for Navajo. The one from the start of our, my slide, the Hogan, the traditional, the interior is a circular space. Um, the light, the left of this circle is white, then blue, then yellow, then darkness. So that charts the path of the sun. So early morning is when we awakening our conscious, our thought, we instill imaginations, we envision what we want to carry out throughout the day. That's the blue section. And then evening is the, the winding down. Um, that's the evening twilight and the darkness is the time to rest and to do your reflection. So this is the path of the sunlight. And this is the order to our system, to our Navajo, who we are. That's how we relate to this system is ke. So in the, in, the, in the Western world, we are taught um, order of operations using the parentheses, exponents, multiplication, and cetera, which we call it as, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, but in Navajo way, we teach this process. So you do the parentheses, that is the early dawn. You do the next process, the exponents, that is the midday. You do the multiplication, division, that's the evening twilight, that's the sunset. And the darkness, you do the addition and the subtraction in the motion of left to right. That is, that is our way we communicate the processes, the procedure to create an outcome. That is our way of tra traditional thinking, relationship to what I talked about, to mature, to develop your number sense to relate to our space and to environment 
which in this case is in relationship to how we grow, to the how our sun is orientated and how it's traveling and how the earth is orientated. And so these colors, it was said that it, it, they were full together and the home was created that way for Navajo. So the power is to think and that's the process that we go through. So next slide. So this process, if you look at this, um, which one we, we communicate, which one we relate, the, the one that is a gray shaded, that's the early dawn, that's the mark to do the, the brackets, to do the parentheses, once that is computed, then you move to the midday, which is in blue section. So blue is highlighted with the exponent. Then you do the, the sunset marked by multiplication, division. So these processes is a journey, it's a process that we interact. It's an intimate, in, in, you, you have that intimate relationship. So the numbers, we look at it as alive, as a living system. So when you're brought in that culture, you respect the number system. And when you more have that respect relationship with this environment, the number, the number sense also become who you are and they talk to you. So the way that they talk is through a process, early dawn, midday, sunset, and then at the end, you do the darkness. So the darkness is about doing your reflection to see if the answer makes sense. So this is our problem solving strategy in Navajo, that the thinking you interact with the vocabulary words, you use your prior knowledge and you can draw under keywords so that they have a meaning and then your experience, your prior knowledge, you integrate that with, with your thinking. And the planning, you draw pictures, you create models, you look at patterns, you build your inferences, you draw your conclusions, and you're able to implement is the, is the, the life, the enough peace. So you go through this journey, the process, and the, at the end, you evaluate, do your assessment, and does this make sense? So negative 10 is the, the sense building, and that becomes the home of the number sense in the mind of who you are as a net person. So this approach is different from the Western education, the Western academic, the Saxon ideology, and this one is the thought and the thinking based on the Navajo principle of who we are as the net people. And that's integrated into the academic and integrated into the, the national math standards. Next. Um, so these are examples um, that are integrated into the academic setting. Um, at the bottom of the corner on the right, the blue, the sand painting, that is Mother Earth. The black one is the universe. So there is a duality. There is a complementary. There is an agreement. So the same lesson applies with geometry. There are agreements. There are complementary. So when we discuss this in the Navajo way of thinking. If you look at um, the angle A, B, D, the top angle measure, that, that signifies the universe, that signifies the cosmos, the environment above you. And then the angle D to your vertex B and to C, that is Mother Earth, so the two um, complement one, one another, and but in geometry sense, they complement to be 90 degrees. So in Navajo, the universe is referenced as beauty above me, 
and the mother earth below is complementing beauty below me. So the two together makes a 90 degree complement angle. So that's the approach to Navajo. And the only way we teach things is with nature, what, what nature has to teach us. And we integrate that, it's a metaphor. It's different symbols standing for different nature. So in this case, complementary angle complements to the universe and the earth together, and they balance together and we call it in Navajo, Hojon. And next slide. So these are visual pictures because in Navajo, we learn by visual aid. Visual is very important. So if you look at the angle um, X on the left side of the diagram and then below me, X more than four. So together it can create an equation. So the two equations, they complement to be 90 degrees and you can search for the missing value. So that together will make 90 degrees. So that is the explanation. So this approach is called the Hojon model, beauty above me plus beauty below me together makes 90 degrees. Just like how you interact with the universe and the earth, you complement together. So in Navajo, it's a holistic teaching. So you don't, eat, you don't just teach the, the academic concept, you teach the character development. You teach about what it means to be a Navajo, how to respect the earth, how to respect the universe, how to respect the plant life and the, whatever environment that you are around. So all that is integrated into a lesson. Next. Um, this one is the supplementary um, two angle, 180. So the around me is your family. The around you is um, the wildlife. The around you is all the aspect that you see and what you interact. And beauty before me is the path that you want to take for yourself and the journey. So together, it's supplement. Together makes 180 degrees. So rather than specifically saying angle D, E, C on the left diagram, where the six X is noted, the metaphor for that is beauty around me. Then the next one, C, E, F, 18 degrees, beauty before me and together makes 180 degrees. So these type of a metaphor helps students to build their thinking. It provides that structure, that framework, that reference point, that guidance, that processes, that procedure, and that outcome. So that's what this does in the geometry of thinking about nature, who we are as people, as the net people. Next, in Navajo, like I said, our fundamental way is kinship. So we relate to our mother as Shema. My mother, we relate to our my father as Shija. And then you yourself, she. So you come from a parent, from parent, and then you have your grandparents up the top row. So in the number sense relationship, you can teach this um, about generations to generation using exponents. So she, me is you. So if you do the exponent two to zero power, that's one. So that represents you as a person in Navajo setting. You come from a metrilinear society. 
So your clan is coming from your mother, who you are as a person. And two to the first power makes two. So you come from a mother, you come from a father. So the two mix um, is very powerful kinship. And your mother and your father comes from, from the next generation group of people. So that will be two to the second power that, that will be four. So you got four grandparents. So that's how you introduce number sense. That's how the students relate, structure. It's engaging, it's relevant to them. It's meaningful to our students when they see a pattern like this within their own kinship and they're able to understand the math even more with excitement and with motivation to learn mathematics. Next. So this is the kinship. This is about um, iteration. Iteration means process, um, a process. So the first iteration of the clan group down here was two to zero power. Then this is two to the first power, two to the second power, iteration two, then two to the third power. So if you put this into the middle column of the chart here, and write it into an exponential expression that will develop the diagram of Navajo kinship. So Navajo is, is really about looking at your, your generation to come because the generation, they're the one that are teaching you knowledge and they're the one that you keep the fire going, who you are as a person. So in Navajo, it's very important that we learn our Navajo language. The language is make us sovereign, make us the ne, who we are as Navajo people. And that relates to our kinship, who we are as, um, as the ne. Next. So here is the, um, the kinship. This um, is sort of like the fonts are small, but if you look at the pattern two to zero power, that shift, that's you. Two to the second, two to the first power, that is two, that's, that's your parents. Two to the second power, that's four, and that's your pater paternal and your paternal grandparents, etc. So the next one will be two to the third, and then your paternal grandparents, their parents, your great, great grandparents. So you see the pattern about exponentials, how far back the generation go, and you remind the students that some of these great, 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 great grandparents you did not see, but they had a vision for you. They had a purpose for you here on earth and the universe, some of those purpose and some of those meaningful life is to have that identity for to be a Navajo, to understand the Navajo philosophy, to understand the Navajo thinking, the Navajo mind, so that you incorporate the thought of to be a Navajo thinker into the academic setting, into your career, into knowledge. And that way you become the unique person who you are, where you come from, from many generations. Next. And the students, they can graph. Like here is the graph of the kinship. So number two is y, y is equal to two to the x power. So two is the base, x is the exponent. So if you graph the earlier slide, with, there was a table of value chart, and this would be an exponential um, graph. So sort of the curves like this. So the students, 
who are able to see visually and how that dysfunction relates to Navajo kinship and how we how important that Navajo kinship is in the eye of our generations of our grandparents and great great grandparents. Next. And the Navajo way of life. Um, we have four main mountains that we look at to um, and then also other mountains. So the Navajo, these mountains are like the pillars of our life, who we are as the net people. That's where the enlightenment, that's where the innovation, that's where the Navajo um, thinking, the mind, that it, it comes from these mountains. So one of the mountain, the, the top one, is that make sure that from the teaching strategies to teach mathematics, that it is culturally um, relevant, just like what I, what I discussed. Then we have the visual aid. Visual aid is present for our students that they're able to see it. And that visual has so much to build that thinking, that framework so that they're able to understand number sense. Make sure hands-on activity is a process that Navajo learn is through processes of touching. And group work, homework is also part of the process. And also the setting and the objectives, which is the math standards, but also the objectives from the Navajo culture the Navajo tradition, the Navajo values, that you are also teaching the character development to be a good citizen, to be a good global citizen, so that you come back to the nation and you build the nation and you help through, through the process. And we also learn by comparing and contrast the Navajo. We like to compare things and we contrast it so that we're able to see what we're understanding, what we're making sense. And then Navajo, we also learn by narration, by storytelling. Storytelling is very powerful in our way of life. In the storytelling, there's humor involved too. So it's good to have that teacher voice with a Navajo thinker so we relate to our students where they come from so that you build that trust, you build that teamwork, you, you build that a sense of who they are from home to classroom space so that they are engaged in both sides of the world, the academic side and also the culture piece of who they are as the people. So these are just a little bit glimpse about um, mathematics, because math is, um, people would say, how do you integrate culture into math? That's usually a question. And this, this is just a few glimpses that, um, that this inspiration, that this could be applied to all background of indigenous people, your culture, who you are to be part of the systemic change in math education so that our students appreciate their values, their philosophy, their grandparents teaching, integrated and combined with the academic component. So it is my charge to be the reformer of a systemic change on the Navajo Nation in promoting math education for my people. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, that was amazing. We do have a couple of questions, Dr. Fowler. One of them is, uh, do you know, is this math model being implemented in uh, public school districts or tribal school? Uh, Navajo, our way of thinking is fluid. 
it we're not in um, static way of thinking. So it's very fluid. It, it could be um, these lessons can be adapted to a certain educator the way they perceive it. So um, it's integrated in um, in public school, in BIE school, grant school, contract school. Great, thank you. Um, there's a lot of comments about how this uh, really makes math relevant um, and an interesting way to uh, integrate culture into math. Let's take a look. Uh, okay, there's no uh, questions in the polls. So we're gonna move on to um, our next set of presenters. Go ahead. Oh, a Gucci Avino, Daya Wachimna Gavino, Uknaki Agijida, and Magi Avino. Hello, my relatives. It's good to see you all. My name is Burnt Soldier, uh, but you can call me Ed. I have on the screen for you here uh, working definition of historical trauma. So we're all starting from uh, the same place. Let me rearrange my notes here for a second. Um, although these terms could be the subject of their own college courses, this slide briefly details uh, certainly not every policy, but many policies, strategies, and tactics that have uh, caused historical trauma. Settler colonialism, religious suppression, suppression of ceremony, uh, and all of that, which I have up there for you to see. Um, This uh, trauma isn't only experienced by Native Americans, it's also experienced by indigenous people everywhere. Palestine, Australia, Tibet, throughout Latin America, Africa, basically anywhere there was or is a colonial settler state. Uh, at the governmental level, these causes include legislation, federal policy, judicial opinion, uh, assassination, execution, um, cultural attitudes and social mores like uh, racism uh, or any other widely held uh, prejudice belief. Um, in the not so distant past, indigenous wisdom, languages and values were heavily discouraged and even outlawed. Forced proselytization, the boarding school period of Native American history, and a succession of increasingly impressive, oppressive and paternalistic policies meant to assimilate Native Americans led to a loss of cultural knowledge, values, ceremonies, language, and speakers. These policies mirror the attitudes of the time and the effects of those losses are still being felt to this day. Next slide, please. Today, there is a new attitude towards indigenous people taking hold in academia and the broader American mindset. Our languages, <clears throat> ceremonies, and cultures are no longer ridiculed or outlawed. However, there is a crisis of knowledge and our teachers are limited. For example, here on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation, we have fewer than 50 of our indigenous speakers. But those speakers, by sharing their knowledge with us, with our students and uh, with uh, their families, um, are in that way able to keep our culture strong, vibrant, uh, living. Uh, in the same way, our teachers um, keep our culture alive by passing their knowledge on to our students. Next slide, please. Chante has developed a special relationship with several members of our communities across the reservation who practice traditional and cultural lifeways. These community members who have been generous to share their cultural practices and skill sets with us and our students via after school programming, uh, their cultural practices are widely enjoyed by the students who participate in the programming. 
the sharing is not just limited to our cultural teachers and students, but our non-native students and teachers uh, also have a crucial role that they play in the uh, sharing of that wisdom and the, the keeping of these life ways uh, alive and uh, relevant today. Um, I believe Marty is our next presenter, so I'll pass it to Marty. Roxanne, Roxanne is our next presenter. I'll pass it to Roxanne. I, guess I had I to unmute. I had to unmute myself. I was like, "Oh my God, where do I do that?" <laughs> Go ahead, Marty. Well, really quick, what we want to talk about is social emotional learning, and I know that was in the keynote speech, and that we feel that's super important to building these pathways for our students, especially with the high levels of trauma in our communities. So some of the things we'll talk about is the brain and the heart logo, culturally responsive teaching, restorative justice circles, Chante with heart at home care packages, MAPS media integration, cultural based after school programs uh, focused around building sustainability. So now I think my ENA is up. Next slide. Wabaha Yuha Narjiwea Mitawa Makyapi, Wakti Tawakba Ekta FPCC, Fort Peck Community College, Womawashi, Chante Washte Yuzijapi, Mitakoye Oyasi. Hello, my relations. My name is Stands with the Eagle Staff Woman. I work at Fort Peck Community College, Poplar, Montana, and with a good heart, I shake your hand. Um, we, we are supposed to have two, actually, have two logos on this on this page. Um, one was taken off for some reason, but we are two tribes here. We are Assiniboine and Sioux, and, and what we like to be called is Dakota and Nakonda, Nakoda. And so we have adopted this as our logo for our program. The Chande and Chande logo represents the heart and the brain. You'll notice that the uh, image has a image of the brain and the heart. Um, during this time uh, of working with our Chante project, we've um, used culturally responsive teaching and education where um, we, are, we are pushing um, cognitive skills along with our heart so that we can show the love to our students. And I know like the previous uh, speaker talked about that too, and it just goes hand in hand with what our, our presentation's about. Um, the act of reading and learning is searching and making connections to what is personally relevant to us and meaningful. What is meaningful to an individual is based on his or her cultural frame of reference. Finding that relevance gives us perspective. So if we know where those kids are coming from, you know, what type of home lives they have, that makes us good instructors and good educators. Chande is our Dakota word for heart. Chande is our Nakota word for heart. We have two tribes, like I said, um, here on our reservation. Um, go ahead and switch to the next slide, please. <clears throat> in utilizing the practices encouraged in the book, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain by Zaretta Hammond, the author stresses the importance for culturally responsive teachers to understand brain science and cultural understanding. The chart, this chart displays the ready for rigor framework. All of the books I've read, I like this book as it stresses social emotional learning. Much of the teaching in the book coincides with their, our traditional ways of knowing our culture. In the past, our people taught their children by example. Children were included in all the daily chores. Each of their lessons were built on the previously learned skill, which would be like scaffolding in education. I remember an elder teacher telling me that young babies were taught to be quiet in times of danger. Um, she said that mamas would touch the child's mouth and say, up. Oh. And so that child would learn that they needed to be quiet at certain times when enemies approached. Um, much of the teaching in the Hammond book are written to encourage teachers to know their students' way of being. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and utilizing, oh wait, no, I'm trying to follow along here. 
Um, each of the four separate practices are independent and they have the following topics. Awareness, being hyper aware of what is the norm in the community, the society in which you teach. And two, learning partnerships, develop partnerships, collaborations to get your foot in the door, to, so to speak, without stepping on anyone's toes. And that's something that we've done here at Chante. We've done a lot of uh, collaborating with other partnership partners um, on our reservation, in our schools. And um, that's what we're all about is getting to, getting to know where we can help out in our communities. Number three, community of learners. Becoming a community of learners is our goal. COVID really slowed us down considerably this past year. We haven't been able to meet with a lot of the people in our communities because there was an initial fear of, the, of contracting the virus. virus. Things have, are slowly opening up again though, however. Number four, learning environment and information processing. Adapting learning environment into a culture of learning and understanding is an ongoing process. In the past, everyone in the family had their role to play. The author states once, that, once the practices are set to play, um, students are ready for rigor and independent learning. The outer circle reflects affirmation, instructional conversion, validation, and wise feedback. So it all becomes whole. Next slide, please. This slide has a picture of one of our elders who is um, teaching out at our Buffalo Ranch. We have um, brought back several um, Yellowstone Buffalo, genetically pure Buffalo to our area. And we've been trying to make that a classroom, which I really feel, feel is important for our kids to reconnect to the land and reconnect and to the Buffalo. And it's been, a, it's been hard because our Buffalo Ranch is actually situated quite a ways from uh, our communities. Um, but these are some of the examples from, from each practice. Number one, understand the levels of culture, three levels of culture. Reimagine the student and teacher's relationship as a partnership. Create an environment that is intellectually and socially safe for learning and provide appropriate challenge that will stimu stimulate brain growth and increase intellectual capacity. By following this framework, you will have confident, competent learners. <clears throat> a lot of um, people do not realize that Native people have an oral culture of storytelling. Um, and so scaffolding lessons will build upon the students' um, knowledge and they will build from that point on. Assimilation has really taken its toll on our people. Many of our old stories are no longer kept. However, there seems to be um, a resurgence to hang on to the older ways. The schools have been contacting us to help them with some of the like traditional foods and understanding some of, um, some of the games that we played in the past. So I know that there's, there's a lot of, there is a resurgence happening. We need to understand that our modern students have, a, have their own culture and their own lingo as well as their home life and how they act around their families. Marty, my boss, is really good at understanding the students TikTok and video game playing. This creates a common ground for him to begin to have a great teacher mentor relationship with our students. Understand that it's important to respect those our children's cultural norms and then use an anti-biased approach with children. And I really feel like our native people have always done that. Um, and, it's, and it's being pushed everywhere, stereotyping and all of, all of that. Um, and I really believe that our cultures have always kept that anti-biased approach with children. Community building also involves families and friends. We've been limited, like I said, with COVID to get out, but that's, we, we're all actually in the schools now. And our Chante team really tries to collaborate with tribal programs like the uh, Wraparound Project and Spotable Treatment Centers Youth Projects. Next slide, please. Another one of the things that we do um, that we've adopted is restorative justice and some book studies. Um, restorative justice empowers students to resolve conflicts on their own and in small groups. And it's a growing practice at schools around the country. Our Dakota and Nakota people are excellent 
We're excellent listeners. Everyone's voice matters. And by integrating restores, restorative justice practices into the schools, we feel it will reignite our old practices. Essentially, the idea is to bring students into small groups to talk, to ask questions, and to air their grievances. It is a non-punitive way to resolve conflict. We have been successful in getting circle talks into our schools. Although a talking stick isn't part of our culture, it helps to control who has the floor, so to speak, and who can speak. We also used it during our professional development workshops that we had, and we were really pleased with the outcome. Challenges are teachers don't want to give up time for running circles. Since COVID, they've been urged to teach bell to bell. Most schools went to a four-day week with Friday set aside for meetings and tutoring. This makes it more of a challenge to introduce and get it going in our schools because teachers need all of the allotted times to cover the curriculum needs. We feel it can be incorporated into all of their courses if teachers would really give it a chance, but it's hard to get teachers to change. We know that research says that restorative justice practices are tried and true rate true ways to resolve issues. Hopefully we can keep advocating the process. What we like the best about restorative justice practices is that it's building positive relations and positive discipline, and it helps with our trauma sensitivity. Next slide, please. And this is- uh, uh, my relations, I know we're running close on time here. Um, and I know the creator always has a plan and it's the way it's supposed to be. I'm gonna talk a little fast here and probably skip a few things and highlight our, uh, our, our big points here. But these, these boxes you see here, we knew during COVID that the, the person to person contact was not gonna happen. And we still needed to reach our children. We still need to reach our at risk families. So we came up with this team with the, an idea of these boxes with heart at home. There were 660 boxes were packaged by our team and were sent out through USPS, designed with the intent of reaching our students and families and providing them an opportunity to read, plant, and sew, just to name a few things. The whole goal of this is maintaining relationships. Being a good relative has always been the cornerstone of our survival and resilience. And this opportunity was no different. We didn't look at it as an obstacle, but we rather we looked at COVID as an opportunity to address things that we wanted to do and on the level we wanted to address them at. Next slide. Yeah, so here, here's kind of, this is just one of the pictures. We, we had some soaps ordered that were, um, everything in these soaps were um, natural, come from the earth. And I, we felt that was important because it kept, this is, these are the things on the earth that kept our people healthy and uh, provided sustenance. We had hand sanitizer in there. We're talking about native health. We're talking about keeping our hands clean, those, those things that we need. There were cultural art supplies in there, watercolor paints and sewing materials so that we could provide that artistic side to our students and to our families as well. We included a cultural uh, powwow CD in there so that uh, we knew that powwow was not gonna be here, um, but that our students and our families could continue to feel the energy of that frequency from the drum. We included indigenous books. Some of those were um, in uh, Inkdomi stories, which you know, in our winter months, that's when we would tell those stories. And uh, like Dr. Fowler mentioned, some of our stories are stories of humor, but every one of our stories are stories of teaching. So these are some of the things that were included in these boxes. We got really, really good uh, feedback from all of our families. The, the one thing they said is, could we get another box? We have five kids in our house. And I said, well, we did one per home to incorporate the family component. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so when we talk about um, preserving culture and what we do, um, the things that we needed to look at is identifying a student interest, identifying appropriate tools. Culture would be the content foundation and practice the cultural art through storytelling. How we did that is we used a system called Zello. That's, we use that as an assessment system. 
And through that, we found out that our kids and our students were really interested in art, but also technology. So we collaborated with a company called Maps Media out of Hamilton, Montana, and their acronym stands for Media Arts and Public Schools. That's something that's not in our schools or wasn't in our schools previous to COVID. We were able to provide an outlet for podcast, photojournalism, and film culturally based around the question of who am I? What makes me me? And then we ask them some why questions. And at the end of that, each school and the students will produce their own um, short film or music video. We were using culture as the content. And, and now, yeah, you can go right there. So this, this, this very complex but simple question of who am I, it was really interesting to see. It took some time for our students to really think about what makes me me. But this short video will kind of give you an idea of where we're trying to reach, if you can play video. Oh, and no sound. I'm a single lawyer. I am resilient. I am an athlete. I am successful. I am scared. I am smart. I am confident. I am calm. I am crazy. I am worthy. I am indigenous. I am a survivor. You can cut, Olani. So, uh, because of time, some of the things that we found while doing this short little intro film was we found that our students are still talking about some of those values and characteristic traits that our ancestors held, and that's being Indigenous warriors, strong. But also, our people were scared at times. Our people are survivors. Our people are resilient. So we're taking that component right there, and uh, we're so pressed for time, but I will tell you real quick, Friday we did a buffalo hunt with 40 of our students and they had never, uh, the vast majority of them had one, never been to the Buffalo Ranch, two, don't have Indian names, three, know nothing about their language. So that's where we're at in our school and so in our schools. And so our fight is real and hats off to Dr. Fowler for having that ability to be able to speak fluently. We don't have that up here. So we're pushing to get that. And I think I will turn this over to Ed. Uh, we're really short on time, brother, so be quick. Um, so what I'm going to share with you now is going to touch on some of the things that uh, Marty and uh, Roxanne mentioned. Um, thank you, Olani, for going ahead to the next slide. Um, learning about our histories, heroes, and accomplishments plays an important part in building the self-esteem and identities of individuals first and then communities. Growing up, for instance, I was never taught about the uh, accomplishments uh, of my ancestors. Even on an Indian reservation, these lessons were omitted from the curriculum. It was not until I reached college that I learned about my history, our history. This cultural erasure leaves a student with the impression that Native Americans resisted oppression, fought heroically, and then rode their horses into the sunset. But of course, we know that uh, isn't what happened. Next slide, please. Um, if people are not taught where they come from, they have no point of reference. They can't place themselves in the past and they can't project themselves into the future if there is nowhere for them to start to build from. If they have no past and they have no future, that leaves them with the present. And if the present is bleak, the outlook is grim. I won't detail every disparity Native people endure on a daily basis except to say that what I'm describing isn't living, it's survival. And that's what I have here at the bottom of the slide for you. Uh, 
easily digestible maxim you guys can take with you into the future. Next slide, please. Um, this is where these cultural activities uh, come into play. This is why they're so important to natives and non-native students. The shame that many of us feel comes from an identity crisis, but by sharing our wisdom and culture with one another, we can begin to build strong identities first and then communities. We can heal the wounds of the past and place ourselves in any future we want for ourselves. When we know the accomplishments of our heroes, we can imitate those accomplishments. We can imitate those heroes. Thank you guys. Okay. This, uh, Sorry. This last slide here is uh, pictures of a couple of the events that we had and then a short list of some of the things that we had. This isn't, of course, everything uh, that we did after school for the students. You can see Marty there, Ron, some of our coordinators, me in the background. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> awesome. So um, I'm going to take a fast look over here at the chat and the polls. Right now, there aren't any questions that I can see. Um, just a lot of people, uh, some people chiming in about how they use restorative circles as well and really liking that video. So we're going to take our last poll. So if you go over to the poll tab, again, the there should be a poll clicking up. So really we're looking back at this implementation and wanna ask you the question, um, maybe in the next year or the next coming years, which area do you feel like you wanna really um, focus in on in order to either begin exploring uh, culture-based and infusing um, culture into your academic program or maybe moving from, uh, we had a lot of people emerging in the last poll, moving from emerging to uh, implementing. So where do you wanna focus um, next year? You can go ahead and take that poll. Awesome, so it looks like a lot of our people who were in emerging in the last poll really wanna sort of focus on um, implementing. That's great. And some who are actually wanting to explore. And then 35% uh, of sustaining. That's awesome. I know in this format right now, you're not able to ask questions, but I wanted to, as you continue to take that poll and we begin to close out this session, uh, I wanted to let you know, you know, looking at action planning, um, really, this poll is really selecting an area of improvement, understanding the current position of your organization, defining what success looks like, and then putting that into action to make a difference, uh, as well as identifying the resources needed for you to do that. Uh, again, a thank you to our presenters um, for the amazing sharing that you folks did. You will, if you want to talk to our presenters later on in the afternoon, there is a networking session um, that's coming up that will be both native language and uh, the native language session presenters, as well as um, our presenters here for um, culture integration. So that's gonna be a really great place to tie in both um, culture infusion, as well as language. Um, you're gonna have about 15 minutes to your next uh, presentation. Take a break, stand up, um, get some water or coffee, uh, if you get back in time, go to the social wall, um, put something, tweet something in, uh, participate in a discussion on the discussion board. Also, before you leave, you'll notice at the top of the um, poll, there is a rate this session. It's got a little star next to it. Why don't you go ahead and um, pick on your rate and pick how many stars you think. One star, um, not so great. This presentation maybe wasn't so great. And five stars, it was awesome. We want to thank again our presenters and thank um, our participants in this session. Are there any other questions? We have a look about a minute. Any questions or two minutes we can take? I'm 
it's looking. Awesome, lots of people saying thank you. Again, don't forget to take that poll. It really helps us know um, what uh, sessions are resonating with you. And we hope to see you this afternoon in the networking session for both culture-based and lang native language um, networking. Aloha and ahui ho. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, panelists.